Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed, and we are going on with Plato's Republic. We are in book six. We're using the lobe, as we have been doing throughout. And as always, there is a link in the description box for a PDF. So what we're looking at this week is we're going into an analogy. And just as a reminder of what we did last time, I want to point you to, what is this, 505A. And uh, this is page 87 for those using the lobe. And this is where Socrates introduced this idea of the idea of good. He says, you have often heard that the greatest thing to learn is the idea of good, by reference to which just things and all the rest become useful and beneficial. Right? So this whole dialogue about justice, after all he's gone through, to create an analogy to tell us what justice is, now he tells us, hey, if you don't know the idea of good, then everything you did about justice doesn't matter. It's out the window. You got to know this, because it's in reference to this, that justice and all the rest become useful and beneficial. So none of that's beneficial until you know this. So we got to know what this is. And I'm going to skip a few pages ahead. This is page 91. So this is a uh, 505E. And now he, he's talking about the good. So that was the idea of good. Now the good itself, he says, it's that which every soul pursues. And it's for the sake, and it's for this, for the good sake, that we do all that we do. And we have an intuition of its reality, he says, but we're baffled by it. We're unable to apprehend its nature adequately or to attain to any stable belief about it as we can do about other things. And for that reason, failing of any possible benefit from other things. So there's again that idea that you have to know the good to truly see the benefit of the ideas or anything else. Right, we talked about that a bit last week, and we ended on the next page, which would be at 506A, that he again talked about the just and honorable, and honorable is actually beautiful in Greek, the just and the beautiful, and again, there's this idea that if their relation in reference to the good is not known, then you will not have secured a guardian of much worth in the man thus ignorant. So again, there's that idea that we have to know the good. We have to know the good and the idea of the good. Otherwise, everything we did about justice is out the window. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Were there any thoughts or questions about what we did last week? We're good? Okay, then let's go on. So what I want to do is there's a lot here. I'll say up front that there's a lot here that would make sense maybe to stop along the way, but I'm thinking we'll just read the whole section and then go back through it and pull out all the different pieces. So it may not make sense up front, but at least you get the whole thing at once in your mind, and then we can go through and talk about it. Okay. Okay, so we're on section 18, and uh, this is, let me get the stuff on this number, B, 506B. Okay, for those with a different translation. All right, shall we jump into it? Okay. I think it starts with, um, I think, is it Glaucon or? I think it's Glaucon. It's me. Necessarily, mm. I said. Mm -hmm. mm. But you, you yourself, Socrates, do you think that knowledge is the good? or pleasure, or something else and different. What a man it is. You made it very plain long ago that you would not be satisfied with what others think about it. Why, it does not seem right to me either, Socrates, to be ready to state the opinions of others, but not one's own when one has occupied in him himself with the matter for so long. But then, do you think it right to speak as having knowledge about things one does not know? By no means, as having knowledge, but one 
ought to be willing to tell as his opinion what he opines. Nay, have you not observed that opinions divorced from knowledge are ugly things? The best of them are blind. Or do you think that those who hold some true opinion without intelligence differ appreciably from blind men who go the right way? They do not differ at all. Is it then ugly things that you prefer to contemplate, things blind and crooked, when you might hear from others what is luminous and fair? Nay, in heaven's name, Socrates, do not draw back, as it were, at the very goal, for it will contend us if you explain the good even as you set forth the nature of justice and sobriety, temperance, and all of the other virtues. It will right well content me, my dear fellow, but I fear that my powers may fail and that in my eagerness I may cut a sorry figure and become a laughingstock. Nay, my beloved, let us dismiss for the time being the nature of the good in itself. For to attain to my present surmise of that, of that seems a pitch above the impulse that wings my flight today. But of what seems to be the offspring of the good and most nearly make in its likeness, I am willing to speak if you too wish it, and, let, and, uh, and otherwise to let the matter drop. What? Oh, well. <laughs> uh, speak on, for you will duly pay me the tale of the parent another time, and you better. I could wish that I were able to make and you to receive the payment, and not merely as now the interest. But at any rate, receive this interest and the offspring of the good. Have a care, however, lest I deceive you unintentionally with a false reckoning of the interest. We will do our best to be on our guard. So speak on. Yes, after first coming to an understanding with you and reminding you of what has been said here before and often on other occasions. What? We predicate to be of many beautiful things and many good things, saying of them severally that they are, and so define them in our speech. Ah, we do. And again, we speak of a self-beautiful and of a good that is only and merely good. And so, in the case of all the things that we then posited as many, we turn about and posit each as a single idea or aspect, assuming it to be a unity and call it that which each really is. It is so. And the one class of things we say can be seen but not thought while the ideas can be thought but not seen. By all means. With which of the parts of ourselves, with which of our faculties, then, do we see visible things? With sight. And do we not hear audibles with hearing and perceive all sensibles with the other senses? Surely? Have you ever observed how much 
the greatest expenditure the creator of the senses has lavished on the faculty of seeing and being seen? Why, uh, no, I have not. Well, look at it thus. Do hearing and voice stand in need of another medium so that the one may hear and the other be heard? In the absence of which third element the one will not hear and the other not be heard? They need nothing. Neither, I fancy, do many others. Not to say that they, uh, not to say that none require anything of the sort. Or do you know of any? Not I. But do you not observe that vision, the visible, do have this further need? How? Though vision may be in the eyes, and its possessor may try to use it, and though color be present, yet without the presence of a third thing, specifically and naturally adapted to this purpose, you are aware that vision will see nothing, and the colors will remain invisible. Invisible, you say? What is this thing of which you speak? The thing that you call light? You say truly. The bond, then, that yokes together visibility and the faculty of sight is more precious by no slight form than that which unites the other pairs, if light is without honor. It surely is far from being so. Okay. Okay, and that's the end of the section. So there's quite a bit here to look at. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. It started off easy enough. Right, it got very confusing at the end there, but it started off relatively comfortable. I mean, these are ideas that we've talked about before, knowledge versus opinion. We talked about that in the Mino and some other dialogues. So that's where he begins the section. Um, and then we see that Glaucon wants him to explain the good the way he explained the virtues. But he says, no, that's, it, it, that's just not going to happen. Um, it would take much more to describe the good, and he's not feeling that. Right, so on page 95, he's saying, no, he's not feeling that. Um, then he re are introduced at 506E to this phrase, the offspring of the good. Now, maybe at this point, we're assuming it's the same thing as the idea of the good. But we don't want to assume. We want to hold on to the question to see what he's going to do with this offspring and see if it is indeed the same or if it's something different. Okay. Um, now, on the next page, he goes into an explanation here. Um, yeah, around 507b, we predicate to be of many beautiful things and many good things, saying that they are. Um, he talks about a good, a few lines down, a good that is only and merely good. Merely sounds like a little bit derogatory. But what's he saying there? A good that is only and merely good. What's he talking about? Or a self-beautiful. What is he talking about there? Is it a kind of experience of the good? A good that is only and merely good. Not anything else. Right, so in our physical world, things are kind of blended together, right? Something beautiful can also be ugly, or something good can also in some ways be bad. Um, something large is only relative to things that are smaller, and so on. But here, he's talking about a good that is only and merely good. It's nothing else. 
So this whole section, what is he, what are the, the comparisons? We've seen this before. This is kind of a review. Like he says, um, um, I want to remind you of what has been said here before and often on other occasions. Okay, so this is, he's not introducing a new idea. He's simply saying we need to go back to this one that we've already talked about. What is this section about right here at this page? Well, he, he's Jay, talking about, in? yeah, he's talking about um, uh, substantive and not an adjective. Um, so it's not relative, like you say. So it's not mm -hmm. an adjective describing things that we see mm -hmm. with our senses. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something like a noun and not yeah. an adjective. Um, but it's one of those ideas we normally associate with adjectives because we don't mm -hmm. see them directly. We only normally see them attributed to something physical, like a good thing or a beautiful thing, beautiful person, a beautiful cat on um, Jacob's mm -hmm. table. Um, mm -hmm. But he's saying the thing itself, mm -hmm. which we, as a noun, so mm -hmm. as though you would see it physically, but you can't see it physically, it can only be apprehended through uh, contemplation or thought, mm. I think, were the two words that he, mm. intellect as well, right. he used as well. Right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you might remember that at the end of book five, he talked about those people who love beautiful, who love beauty itself versus those who love beautiful things. And so that's what he's going back to here. There are beautiful things and then there's the self beautiful or beauty itself. There are good things, and then there is the good itself. Here he's talking about good as an ego, so which makes it confusing because the good itself is a different phrase. <clears throat> and it's something beyond. We're going to see beyond the ideas. By the way, sorry my voice is a little scratchy. My kids are both sick, and uh, I'm on the verge. I'm really fighting it off. I've been taking echinacea. It's an herb to try to that you take when you're like on the verge of a cold, and it kicks it. But... So far, I've been saying healthy, but my voice is a little scratchy. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> okay, so that's what he's doing here. So each is a unity. Okay, this is important in our metaphysics. We talk about parts in our physical world. We talk about wholes as intelligibles. Beyond that, there is unity. But to have a unity, to have a whole, you must be able to come together into a unity. So whole presupposes unity. But unity presupposes one. So at the very top of our metaphysical hierarchy is the one, but then there's unity. So this is so these ideas or these eidos are unities. And it's what each really is. Okay, so he's introducing them. The one class of things we say can be seen but not thought while the ideas can be thought but not seen. And that's what Jed was saying. We see them with noose, with the intellect. Okay, so from this, he's going to go into an analogy. And here he's just starting to build it. With which of the parts of ourselves, with which of our faculties then, do we see visible things? With sight. And do we not hear audibles with hearing? Okay, now he goes into this example. This one's always bothered me. Apparently in Plato's day, they didn't know about sound waves and they didn't realize that air is the medium that hearing goes through. Um, but this is not a science book. So we're going to just uh, let that one go. Um, but we want to focus on the analogy he's building. We're more interested in the metaphysical side of the analogy than the physical side. So never mind that there are other examples other than vision that has a medium. We're going to look at his example of light being the bond between vision and visibility. And we're going to see what are the analogs on the metaphysical side of the chart. So what he's giving us here is the physical side. Okay. Um, 
And I'm going to jump a bit. So there's his sound example that he rejected, that we can reject. Uh, vision may be in the eyes and its possessor may try to use it. And though color be present, yet without the presence of a third thing specifically and naturally adapted to this purpose, you are aware that vision will see nothing and the colors will remain invisible. Right? Because all we really see are colors. Artists know this and they use that to great effect. Right. Think of like trick art. Somebody can like paint on the sidewalk and make it look like there's a huge gaping hole and even animals will walk around it because they're just using color to give the appearance of depth. All we really see are color. But what he's telling us here is that you've got vision, which you might call or, or sight or vision, which is like the power of seeing. And then there's visibility, which is the power of being seen. But he's telling us that there must be some bond. The bond then, this is the very end of the section, the bond then, yeah, sorry, this highlighter went wrong. Um, let me highlight this. The bond then that yokes together visibility and the faculty of sight is more precious by no slight form than that which unites the other pairs if light is not without honor. So I'm going to try to share my screen. So hopefully you are seeing a little chart there. We're going to keep building on this. So we've got two sides of our analogy. Right now we only have the physical side. So I put that on the left. On the right, we're going to put the metaphysical. So you've got sight which you might call the power of seeing. And you've got visibility, the power of being seen. And the bond that connects them, he's telling us, is light. Okay, so we want to hold on to these three ideas. And now we're going to go on to the next section. Now this one, sorry, there's a card just passed. I don't know if you just heard that or not, but it was very loud. Um, so now in this section, it's going to start off, it's going to seem like a curveball is being thrown to us, but we'll just run with it and see where he's going. And um, again, I'd like to just read through the whole section, and then we'll go through it and see if we can build our analogy. Okay, any questions or thoughts, though, up to this point? Are we all on the same page so far? Yes. We're good. Okay, great. Okay, so it's going to start with Socrates, section 19. Okay. Which one can you name of the divinities in heaven as the author and cause of this, whose light makes our vision see best and visible things to be seen? Why the one? Uh, your microphone's going in and out. You just went out for me. Sorry. Um, okay. Why the one that you two and other people mean? For your question evidently refers to the sun. Is not this then the relation of vision to that divinity? What? Neither vision itself nor its vehicle, which we call the eye, is identical with the sun. Why, no. But it is, I think, the most sun-like of all the instruments of sense. Okay. By far the most sun-like. And does it not receive the power which it possesses as an influx, as it were, dispensed from the sun? Certainly. Is it not also true that the sun is not vision, yet as being the cause thereof is beheld by vision itself? That is so. This, then, you must understand that I meant by the offspring of the good, 
which the good begot to stand in proportion with itself. As the good is in the intelligible region to reason and the objects of reason, so is this in the visible world to vision and the objects of vision. How is that? Explain further. You are aware that when the eyes are no longer turned upon objects upon whose colors the light of day falls, but that of the dim luminaries of night, their edge is blunted and they appear almost blind, as if pure vision did not dwell in them. Yes, indeed. But when I take it, they are directed upon objects illuminated by the sun, they see clearly, and vision appears to reside in these same eyes. Certainly. Apply this comparison to the soul also in this way. When it is firmly fixed on the domain where truth and reality shine resplendent, it apprehends and knows them and appears to possess reason. But when it inclines to that region which is mingled with darkness, the world of becoming and passing away, it opines only and its edge is blunted and it shifts its opinions hither and thither and seems and again seems as if it lacked reason. Yes, it does. This reality, then, that gives their truth to the objects of knowledge and the power of knowing to the knower you must say is the idea of good, and you must conceive it as being the cause of knowledge and of truth in so far as known. Yet, fair as they both are, knowledge and truth, in supposing it to be something fairer still than these, you will think rightly of it. But as for knowledge and truth, even as in our illustration, it is right to deem light and vision sun-like, but never to think that they are the sun. So here it is right to consider these two their counterparts, as being like the good or boniform, but to think that either of them is the good is not right. Still higher honor belongs to the possession and habit of the good. An inconceivable beauty you speak of, if it is the source of knowledge and truth, and yet itself surpasses them in beauty. For you surely cannot mean that it is pleasure. Hush, but examine the similitude of it still further in this way. How? Oh. The sun, I presume you will say, not only furnishes to visibles the power of visibility, but it also provides for their generation and growth and nurture, though it is not itself generation. Well, of course not. In like manner, then, you are to say that the objects of knowledge not only receive from the presence of the good their being known, but their very existence and essence is derived to them from it, though the good itself is not essence, but still transcends essence in dignity and surpassing power. Okay, we've got quite a bit here, don't we? So we're going to go back to the beginning of this section. Now, it may seem like a curveball here to throw in this idea of a divinity in the heavens that is the author and cause of this light. Um, we don't think of the sun or the planets in the same way, but we know that in 
Greek mythology. This is the way it's talked about. Now, the way I understand it, or the way I think about it, is that um, he's really talking about the soul of the planet or the sun. Right? So he's talking about a, a soul. It's a divinity in that sense. It's not the physical sun. The physical suns come and go, but there's some divinity that is, you might say, embodied in the sun. And so we can also talk about sometimes, like if a person is very, um, very advanced, let's say, um, that they carry themselves in a godlike way. And so they take on maybe the image of God in the, in a sense. And so you may, you may talk about the physical sun as being divine, but it's in the sense of that it's ensouled by a god. Okay, so we're looking at what he's doing with this analogy. We don't have to necessarily um, subscribe to this theory that vision is from the sun. But we're going to see what he's doing with it. Because remember that for him, the metaphysical side of the analogy is the one he's really focused on. And when he pulls things out of the physical world, whether it's a city-state or it's this analogy, he's building it in a way that makes the that shows what he wants to show about the metaphysical side. So that's where we're focused, right? So you've got the sun as the cause of this light. And the light, remember, is the bond that connects the power of seeing with the power of being seen. Okay, so that's where we are so far. And then he goes on to say that neither vision itself nor its vehicle, which we call the eye, is identical with the sun. Now, this is significant not only for this analogy, but also for metaphysics in general, that it is not the physical eye that has vision. It is the soul. The soul perceives. When the soul uses the eye as its vehicle, it, we call that vision. When the soul uses the ears, we call that hearing, and so on. So these are the vehicles that allow the soul to perceive in our physical world. Okay, and this is also important for our analogy. So we're holding on to that image. The eye is the vehicle. There is a power of seeing that uses the eye as its vehicle. And it's the most sun-like, he says, of all the instruments of sense. And does it not receive the power which it possesses as an influx, as it were, dispensed from the sun? So again, we're seeing the sun is the cause of this power. Okay, so the light, so the sun causes the light, which then gives the power, but the power ultimately comes from the sun. And the sun is not vision, yet as being the cause thereof, it is beheld by vision itself. Now, this is something that really does not fit our um, everyday ways of thinking, but we can hear the metaphysics in it, that um, vision reverts to its cause and it sees its cause. So this power of vision using the eye can turn back and look at the sun in the physical world which doesn't make a whole lot of sense as far as like understanding vision. But you can hear in it the echoes of metaphysics, the idea of reversion, looking back and knowing itself. So you can kind of get a feel of where it's going. Or you can at least see that there's something metaphysical he's going to explain here. Okay, so there's the idea of turning back and reverting on itself. The cause can be beheld by vision itself, by that power of seeing. Now we have a key phrase here. This then you must understand that I meant by the offspring of the good. So there's that phrase again. Again, we don't know what it is, but he's, we're going to try to figure it out. So this offspring, the good begot it to stand in a proportion with itself. As the, and then we have an analogy. So proportion, by the way, is analogos in Greek, which means another logos. And the same word is sometimes translated as analogy. So 
for the when we will sometimes use the word proportion and sometimes the word analogy. It's the same Greek word. Okay, so he's creating an analogy here. And here's his analogy. As the good is in the intelligible reason, region, excuse me, to reason. Reason, by the way, is noose. Wherever you see re, um, reason in this section, always think noose, which is also intellect. So as the good is in the intelligible re region, I did it again. <laughs> Let me start that again. As the good is in the intelligible region to noose and the objects of noose. So is this, this in, and he's talking about the sun and this offspring. You can kind of see those two are connected. In the visible world to vision and the objects of vision. Now, if you look at the little footnote by Offspring of Good, I'm not going to bother looking at it, but those of you who want to, who have this um, copy can look at it later. And you can see that the translator is implying that the offspring of the good is indeed equal to the idea of good. Um, so if you are thinking that, you're certainly in good company. But we don't want to just follow the crowd. We want to try to piece it all together and see for ourselves if that really is correct. Okay, so we see that on the side of the physical, in our analogy, we have the power of seeing, that's um, vision, and the objects of vision are the power of being seen. Now this bond has now become sunlight, as opposed to just light in general. But now we can get a little bit more about the other side. Because now we see that analogous to the sun, which he's calling here the offspring of the good. By the way, are we all in agreement with that or any question about that? Do you agree that he's calling the offspring, the sun is the offspring of the good? Does that flow? Right. Okay. Okay. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I don't want to be jumping ahead. Okay. Mm. Sorry? The principle or the soul of sons. Yes, yes, yes. So whatever that is, that God, that divinity is the offspring of the good. And that is the ultimate cause of vision and the objects of vision. It's sunlight is the bond that connects the power of seeing to the power of being seen. Now we can go to the metaphysical side and see that analogous to this offspring of the good, to this divinity that... Um, reigns over our physical world, there is the good itself that reigns over the intelligible reason, region. I did it again. Why do I keep doing that? That reigns over the intelligible region. And now we can see then that he is connecting noose as the analog to vision. So whereas on the, in the physical world we talk about the power of seeing, in the um, metaphysical world, we can talk about noose, the power of knowing or seeing in that metaphysical sense, that metaphorical sense. And then the objects of noose, that which has the power of being known, and we call those intelligibles. And so, at this point, we still don't know much about that light. We're not quite clear what is the analog to sunlight, right? But do we have these pieces? Do we agree on these pieces? And I can bring up that next page there. So you have the power of knowing and the power of being known. And now he has named that as noose. And we might call it the intelligibility, the um, intelligibles. Okay, we're good? Okay. So now we'll go on to the next piece. You're aware that when the eyes are no longer turned upon objects upon whose colors the light of day falls, but that of the dim luminaries of night, their edge is blunted and they appear almost blind, as if pure vision did not dwell in them. They appear almost blind, as if pure vision did not dwell in them. Okay, these are appearances. 
but when I take it, they are directed upon objects illumined by the sun. They see clearly, and vision appears, there it is again, appears to reside in these same eyes. So now he tells us to apply the same comparison to the soul. I'm going to just highlight that. To the soul. When the soul is firmly fixed on the domain where truth and reality shine resplendently. So they're lit up. Whatever the uh, metaphysical analog of um, sunlight is. It's shining on these things that have the power of being known. Right? When the soul is fixed on this domain, it appears to know them and it appears to possess noose. Remember, it's not the eye that sees, it is the soul, right? So this kind of connects, right, the two sides. So it is the soul that can look at the physical world using the eye as its instrument, and it is the soul that can also look upwards, you might say, to that domain where truth and reality shine resplendent. And then it appears to possess noose. Uh, what does this mean? Metaphysically, what, does, what is he pointing out here? Have either of you seen this idea before? Okay, Jed. Well, yeah, he, he says that, um, I guess we're using the lesser to understand the greater. Uh, mm -hmm. And vision is the lesser and knowledge is the greater. So he says, uh, when we are in the dark, it's like we're blind. But when we are in light, uh, the eyes appear to possess vision. But he's mm -hmm. saying, well, we don't have, it's not something we mm -hmm. possess. It's, it seems mm -hmm. to be a kind of relationship between several different parts. Light, the source of light, mm -hmm. and our eyes. Some sort of three-way mm -hmm. relationship happening. So I'm guessing if he's using that same expression, appears to have mm -hmm. news, then maybe mm -hmm. would it follow that noose also isn't something we have, but is a word defining a kind of relationship between key parts? Perfect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. In the previous section, he actually did use the phrase that vision is in the eyes, but he got more specific here. He clarified that it's not actually in the eyes. The eye is an instrument that the soul uses to see. And likewise, as Jed pointed out here, noose is not in the soul. It is a higher realm that we can participate in. We as soul can participate in intellect or in news, but we don't possess it. So you okay, can't so it call anybody smart. So, so you can't rightly say that somebody is, is smart. They're either sharing in, their, in that relationship and they appear to be smart, but they're just able to reflect smartness or they're not in that relationship. You wouldn't say a person yeah. is intelligent themselves. It, it depends on what you mean by in, how you're using the word intellect or smart, because we use it in the colloquial sense to mean a person who's maybe has a, a quick wit or um, good memory, those sorts of qualities. And a person may have those qualities, but um, here intellect is in a higher sense. It's not about IQ, right? So I just want to clarify that. But, but wouldn't um, that a person that, may not like... be wise... Yeah, it's, it's, pro it's problematic to call the person wise. They're either participating in news or they're not. Hmm. That's interesting, because well, why wouldn't all those other things that we normally qualify mm -hmm. as IQ, wouldn't they be aspects of intelligence itself? Like you could say, oh, you're keen of mm -hmm. sight, but mm -hmm. isn't that vision? Well, yes and no, because um, like we saw that the, qualifi that the qualities that the philosopher ought to have are things like good memory and um, quickness. And um, there is that sense in which when we talk about good memory, the way we talked about it is memory of those highest experiences. And in that regard, yes, absolutely, what you're saying is right. But we can also think about people who are just really good at school, for example. It doesn't mean they're participating in news. Mm, interesting.
So I wonder if even that would be the same reflection, just not. Mm. Yeah, a lesser reflection, you might say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and like, yeah, mm-hmm. and if we're saying, oh, the mm-hmm. uh, the qualities that qualify you as a philosopher, like memory, mm-hmm. are to, uh, like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, quick of wit, are to do with your memory of that experience, it seems mm-hmm. like the qualifications is just a natural um, tendency to be looking towards, mm-hmm. with that, even if mm-hmm. you're not realizing that's where you're getting your intelligence mm-hmm. from, but a natural tendency or disposition towards news. Like you're mm-hmm. reflecting that light. It's our natural state to participate in news, I would say. But most people don't know that. And Just so, like you can say, mm-hmm. like the other things he qualified here, beauty itself, mm-hmm. somebody who's naturally mm-hmm. beautiful, we mm-hmm. as philosophers recognize, well, you're only beautiful because you're reflecting beauty itself. Mm-hmm. They don't know it. Mm-hmm. But they are the same way somebody who's intelligent, oh, you're only intelligent because you're reflecting news or you're somehow able to share in it. You might not be realizing that's where your intelligence comes from, but you don't have intelligence in your soul. It's a relationship with the offspring of the good. Just like you don't have sight in your vision, you can't say you're keen of sight. You're more able to share in that relationship with vision itself or with light and the sun. Right, yeah. But like we saw in the symposium that there are, le- we might say, levels of beauty that express themselves in, in this physical world. And so there are some lower ones. And so we wouldn't call a physically beautiful person necessarily wise. right? And in the same way, I wouldn't call a person who's good at school, who gets all A's, necessarily wise. That's not a participation in news. Yeah. No, there's a lot of sunlight yeah. bouncing off them. They're just not realizing yes. that and directing it towards the right mm-hmm. object. Yeah. All right. So going back here there, when the soul is firmly fixed on the domain where truth and reality shine resplendent, it appears to know them. It appears to know truth and reality. And it appears to possess noose. But when it inclines to that region which is mingled with darkness... The world of becoming and passing away, our physical world. Then it opines only, and its edge is blunted, and it shifts its opinions hither and thither. And again, it seems as if it lacks reason. But again, it doesn't actually have reason. It just either participates in it or it doesn't. And he agrees. Now here's a key line. This reality... So we're talking about a reality, an absolute reality that gives their truth to the objects of knowledge. The objects of knowledge, remember we said, are the intelligibles. What gives the intelligibles their truth? This is is this reality that he's talking about here. And it gives the power of knowing to the knower. Who's the knower? The soul. Move this comparison to the soul. When the soul is fixed on this region and it appears to have noose, it's participating in noose, it knows, right? So the soul is the knower. So we're talking about some reality that gives intelligibles their truth and it gives the soul the power of knowing. And this is the idea of good. So where would we put idea of good in our in our little chart? So sunlight is what gives that power of seeing. It gives us the power of seeing and it gives the power of being seen, right? When light is not shining, on something, you can't see it. It's with a bond that connects those two things and it gives the power of seeing and it gives the power of being seen. How would that translate to the other side, to the metaphysical side? How is what he's saying here help us understand the other side of that analogy? Where's my cursor? Oh, there it is. Let me highlight this sentence.
Not sure yet. Okay, we'll go on a little more and we'll come back to it. Okay, so the idea of good, going back to the beginning of the sentence, now we can carry this one. It's kind of a reverted sentence, so now we can take idea of good to the beginning of the sentence. Is the reality, the idea of good is the reality that gives objects of knowledge their truth. Gives their truth to the objects of knowledge. And it gives the power of knowing to the knower. And you must conceive it, the idea of good, as being the cause of knowledge. Remember, the intelligibles are the home of knowledge, right? They are knowable. But it is the cause of that knowledge. And it is the cause of truth insofar as known. Right? It cannot give truth unless it itself is truth. So you're putting truth in the metaphysical hierarchy. It is here at the idea of good. So Jacob, any ideas here as to where you would put idea of good in our little chart? Well, it would be high up on the chart since mm -hmm. the idea of the good gives truth to mm -hmm. uh, essentially noose mm -hmm. we know what's true by it mm -hmm. how does this physical side of our analogy help us understand the idea of good what is he saying here that it's the middle mm -hmm. part of that is the bond good. the idea of the good links uh exactly yeah. mm -hmm. cool yes and so now we see that our translator as clever as he might be and as much as we appreciate his translation he made a little boo-boo here because he equated the idea of good with the offspring but the offspring is the sun it is what is leading it is what is reigning over the physical side and it is analogous or a proportion to the good but the idea of good is something different. It's on the metaphysical side. And as Jacob's saying, it's much higher. Right? So you've got nous as the power of knowing. That's the reason. And we've got the intelligibles, or I often call them absolute realities, as the is that which is known, has intelligibility, the power of being known. And now he's telling us that the idea of good is like that metaphysical sunlight that gives intelligibles the power of being known, and it gives news the, in the soul that can participate in news the power of knowing the intelligibles. And so here we're seeing a lot of the whole metaphysical hierarchy that is really unfolded by Proclus and other later Platonists. Um, we were talking earlier before recording that the word Neoplatonism is troublesome because I think some academics, you know, want to um, distinguish them as different from Plato. So they try to separate it off. But there's a continuity that runs through it. And the so-called Neoplatonists are following Plato. And so you can see very much for those of you who have studied Proclus, you can see his whole hierarchy right here. That at the bottom, for, if we're going to go upwards from the soul, the soul can participate in noose. Nous then can turn and look to its cause. So there's that idea of reverting to its cause that we saw with the sun. It can revert to its cause, the intelligibles. But what gives them their power to be known and, and to know is the idea of good. And its cause is the good. And then we also see here this idea of truth that if you were to place truth somewhere in this hierarchy, well, actually, I'm going to hold off on that because he's going to say more about it as we go on. But so far, that is the hierarchy. Did Sox get all that? I hope so. Yes, yes, he seems very interested in this uh, now that we've uncovered mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah, this, he, this was the exciting part he was waiting for. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, 
I thought you were asking if Socrates was saying it right because you, uh, you were calling yeah, Socrates call him socks by his... for shorts. Yeah, because yeah. you know we're so close, we call him socks for shorts. Mm. Oh. So far, are we all on the same page as far as how the analogy is unfolding? So it sounds like uh, when when in vision, the physical world, we have our eyes, we have an object, and we have sh a light that has a relationship. So I talked about a three-way relationship, but really it's two different two-way relationships. Um, the light has a relationship with the object, giving it its ability to be seen. The mm -hmm. light uh, shines on our eyes, giving us the ability to have vision. And then that allows for a, a kind of activity that we call um, seeing. And so it sounds like he's saying that um, uh, the idea of the good shines on the objects in the realm of being, mm -hmm. noose, to give them uh, their truth, which is the power to be known, like of their nature, mm -hmm. and um, uh, gives, shines on our soul to give us the power of knowing. Mm -hmm. So you've got this expression here. Um, this reality then gives the truth to the objects of knowing and the power of knowing to, to the knower. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the good or the offspring of the good is like the light mm -hmm. um, giving truth. Oh, no, the idea of the good, not the offspring. The offspring is something different. The offspring he put in proportion with the good. It is the sun. In our analogy. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right, right, right. Yeah. The, the, the child of the creation, right? So um, mm -hmm. um, uh, so we have the idea of the good is like the light. It gives a, a nature to the beings, and we call that nature truth. It gives uh, power to the soul that allows us to uh, know things. Mm -hmm. And... So we've got a nature of truth, a power of uh, knowing, um, and then give, creating the conditions for an activity between the two. So I guess there's three mm -hmm. kinds of relationships. There's the light, mm -hmm. the light to the object giving its nature, mm -hmm. which is that hierarchy of uh, being, power, activity. Mm -hmm. The nature of truth, the power of knowing, creating the conditions mm -hmm. for the activity for us to be smart. Nice. Wise. Yeah, I've got a few more little charts here. We can see it in visuals. You've got your sun and your sunlight. And it is the sunlight that gives the power of, that gives the eye, actually the soul, using the instrument of the eye, the power of seeing. And it gives visible things, the power of being seen. And then we can go one more step here and say, that the sun is analogous to the good, and he called the sun the offspring of the good because it's standing in proportion to it. It's reigning again over the physical world. And then on the metaphysical side, you have the good. The sunlight that comes out of the sun is analogous to the idea of good, and it gives news its power to see or to know, and it gives intelligibles the power to be known. And if if he's leaving out the higher and hypothetically speaking, if he's doing that thing that he does sometimes of um, giving you the, well, literally here, he's giving us the lesser to understand the higher to with mm -hmm. eyes in the sun. Mm -hmm. And before he um, began this whole thing, he said, by the way, the higher is related to the good. I'm not going to give it to you. And from our reading, we've recognized that's kind of a, a tool that Socrates uses to indicate mm -hmm. there might be a question here he's wanting us to discover and use the knowledge that we gain from the explicit to mm -hmm. answer the implicit or the hidden question. Mm -hmm. um, could we therefore ask, once we nail this down, how the idea of the good relating to the intelligibles and our soul uh, like light 
how the good therefore relates to the idea of the good in a similar mm -hmm. way. Sure. Yeah. And in fact, that's a good segue to go on because you you saw as we, when we read through it the first time that he does say a little bit more about that. So those are good questions. He, and I agree with you that he left it out because he wants us to fill it in. But he's going to give us a little bit more to work with. So let's go on. So he says, um, the idea of the good you must conceive as being the cause of knowledge and of truth insofar as known. Yet fair, by the way, fair, remember, is always beautiful. Okay. Doesn't mean fair skin, doesn't mean justice, or okay. it always means beautiful in this translation. Yet oh, by the way, I, I did, I, I'm not, sorry, you, you mentioned I saw this before reading before. I'm mm -hmm. not pulling that from a previous reading. I just um, was looking at your diagram and I saw mm -hmm. the light and I thought, oh, there's a good up there. But I wonder if that mm -hmm. triad, and it's confusing because mm -hmm. what would be if you made the good the light that shines on the idea mm -hmm. of the good, mm -hmm. then it kind of breaks down a little bit because there's no sun for the good itself. So I was just mm -hmm. wondering about mm -hmm. that. Right. They are he's separated, clearly, the sun and the sunlight. And the good and the idea of good. And if we take up to the next right. level up mm -hmm. and make the good mm -hmm. the sunlight, what work. would be? Mm -hmm. Oh no, I think that that's the that's the puzzle I was talking about. No, oh, but uh, I thought you said if we take the good and make it sunlight. Yeah. That would be twisting because the sunlight is here, and the sun is here, right? This is the sunlight. This is the sun. In the analogy right that's the analogy he's giving us but if there is a hidden one that he's not giving us because you know whatever excuse he said to not make it explicit then mm -hmm. uh so the uh you got the intelligibles and the soul mm -hmm. and the idea of the good relating to that the question would be what would be the equivalent on the next level up so that's to make, therefore, the good, the sunlight affecting something similar to the intelligibles of the idea of good and similar to the soul of in the idea mm. of good. It sounds like you're trying to equate the good and the idea of good, but he made it very clear they're different. I know, they're, they're, they're of a different mm. realm, but if the mm. uh, principle that we solve puzzles through is um, uh -huh. as above, so below, what would be the equivalent uh -huh. on the anagogic level? The higher next step, next step up. Sure, Jean. Well, let's go on and see what he's doing here. Okay, so we'll take it step by step. I want to try to stay close to the text here. Um, Fair as they both are, knowledge and truth, and supposing it to be something, supposing it to be something fair still than these, you will think rightly of it. So the idea of good is more beautiful than knowledge and truth. Knowledge and truth at the level of the intelligible. It gives them their truth, and it makes the intelligibles knowable. Um, but as for knowledge and truth, even as in our illustration, it is right to deem light and vision sun-like. I'm going to come back here for a moment. Okay, light and vision are sun-like, but they're not the sun. Um, so here, okay, um, so sorry, let me, I skipped the line. Um, even as in our illustration, it is right to deem light and vision sun-like, but never to think they are the sun. So here, on the other side of the analogy, it is right to consider these two, truth and knowledge, their counterparts as being like the good or to be born of form, but to think that either of them is the good is not right. All right, so again, the idea of good and noose are not, they're bona form, but not the good. Still higher honor belongs to the possession and habit of the good. So now he's going to say a little bit about that, which he said he's not going to talk about. Okay, it's an inconceivable beauty. It's not pleasure. Tells him, hush, hush, that's nonsense. We want to examine the similitude still further. The sun, I presume you will say, not only furnishes to visibles the power of visibility, 
It also provides for their generation and growth. Okay, now before he said it was the lights that provided, that was the cause of visibility. But in our metaphysics, we see that there can be a series of causes. So the cause of the cause is the higher cause, right? So the sun being the cause of that sunlight is the ultimate cause. So the sunlight is the cause of visibility, but its cause would be the higher cause. And so the sun, he's saying here, not only is the cause of this, of this um, power of being seen or visibility, but he's going to go another step and say it provides for their generation and growth and nurture. But it itself is beyond. It transcends generation. It transcends growth. It transcends nurture. And now he's going to say something similar on the other side. The objects of knowledge not only receive from the presence of the good, they're being known. So again, it's the higher cause. The good is the higher cause, the ultimate cause, the final cause. And it gives them their knowledge of, or their power of being known but also their very existence. Existence, I believe, is A9. I think I wrote it down. I think that's A9 in Greek, for those of you who read Greek. Um, their existence, their A9, and their essence, usia. And it's, it is derived to them from it, from the good itself. That is the final cause in our metaphysics. But the good itself is not usia. It transcends usia both in dignity and surpassing power. Is that meaning clear? I think I, I, think I have mm. some more clues towards my puzzle. Mm. So if we've mm. got um, uh, the nature of visibility on the bottom level, like the physical level, mm -hmm. the nature of visibility and the power of sight from sunlight next level mm -hmm. up you've got um the nature of or knowability we call truth and uh for uh and the power to know called noose for our soul and given by the light being the idea of the good and then on the third level that was my uh question level uh we've got uh this existence Ine and uh, Usia, and mm -hmm. the equivalent of the sunlight would be the good. Mm. No, the the sunlight is not the good. On on the um on the bottom level, the sunlight is literal sunlight. On the middle level, the sunlight is the idea of good, giving uh, noose and yes. nobility. And on the top level, the um the Implicit question, um, it sounds like the two terms equivalent to um, truth and noose is existence and usia. So we've got visible, yeah. seeing, mm. um, truth, noose, uh, ani, and usia. Yeah, I would just um, push back on one part of what you said there. Um, he says that, so Noose is intellect, right? And that's the power to know. And mm. the intelligibles are knowledge. But they get their truth from the idea of good. Now, Proclus actually goes the next step and says that because they get their truth from the idea of good, that's where he would put truth in our metaphysical hierarchy. Um, some of the places here where um, the translator puts um, knowledge, some places it's episteme and sometimes it's um, a dianos, which is like a, a derivative of dianoia. And so it seems like he's talking about dianoetic knowledge, um, which may be helpful in understanding why it's lower in the hierarchy than where it would ultimately be. It's, but if they get their truth from the idea of good, then they must be participating in truth from the idea of good. 
Okay, so that's where truth would be. I would put knowledge here at the intelligibles. And intellect, of course, is news. And this is, I would put, where truth is. But good is then the ultimate cause that transcends all of it. But is the ultimate cause of all of it. Right, right. And so I'm asking this question because we're, I guess we're doing two things as philosophers. We want to apprehend the idea of being with our soul and become wise. But then, mm -hmm. um, like we've seen in the other texts, we don't stop there. So there's the mm -hmm. next question. Once we're at the um, idea of the good or at being, uh, mm -hmm. what do we, how do we spend our time? So that's why I was adding mm -hmm. that third level. Like, well, okay, mm -hmm. can we use this analogy to, to uh, uh, inform our next pursuit of the nature of the good? The one that he's not telling us, but he wants us to figure right. out for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. that point, I agree with you. Yes. Yes, I agree that we want to be hold on to this question of what is the good. Because he's and told us we... many times that we have to know the good in order to even for justice and the other virtues to even be useful or beneficial to us. Which is a big question, like know thyself, but in mm -hmm. some strange way, mm -hmm. it's not knowable, but it is knowable. It's, that's the big puzzle. In what way do you know the good? Mm -hmm. um, or what's that final stage of enlightenment or mm -hmm. however you want to say mm -hmm. it. And can we use this analogy to gain an insight into the way that if we were at that level of being, um, in what way would we know this, the cause that allows us to know it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this very oh. existence oh. and is, uh, Ane and Usia may be the way in which, I don't know, Um, things in our physical world get their existence and usia, um, or I'm sorry, um, in the um, things that in the in the higher realm, excuse me, um, get their existence, their being. Ana is a higher sense of. There are many words, I guess, that translate as to be, and some can more in our physical world. I think esteem is the is the word that's used in the realm of becoming. But Ani is one of the words that's used in the intelligible realm. And so things that get their being and their usia from the good is the first cause of all you seeing here. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So mm -hmm. we are in a relationship with the ideas in being through noose. And mm -hmm. so the beings have to have truth for them to be knowable. And then mm -hmm. we have to have noose to know them. And, mm -hmm. uh, that is given to us through the light of the idea of the good. But mm -hmm. in a similar way, um, there is something that more primarily exists or, or exists in a more fundamental way. Mm -hmm. And when we're at that level of being itself, we grasp that thing that fundamentally exists. Mm -hmm through a kind of usia upon our first cause, and maybe that's mm -hmm. the way in which being uh, reaches its final step of knowing the good, through a kind of usia upon its first cause, knowing that which fundamentally exists. Hmm. Although we have to be careful not to suggest that the good can be experienced. Well, how do we know the self then? Beyond the idea of good. Because it transcends. Oh, yes, it transcends. But then how do we know mm. the good? Mm. That's the question you're holding on to. So and I'm, so, I'm wondering if this word, uh, Ane mm -hmm. and Usia, are clues to know, because this is beyond experience, but maybe these two words are well, clues. Well, Ane and Usia, um, the good transcends both Ane and Usia. Right, in the same way that the idea of the good transcends both truth and noose, but gives it, but can give it to those things, can give it to give noose to soul and can give truth to beings, but transcends it and by being its cause. Yeah, and it also gives them Ani and Usia. Oh, see, I, I, I thought I was taking this last sentence to mean analogously so the presence of the good. In the same way, the idea of the good gives these two. In the similar mm -hmm. way, the good itself doesn't give 
truth and noose, it gives anionousia to the realm of being. It's the cause from the presence of the good. Well, it, it not only is the cause of the idea of good, which gives truth to the objects of knowledge, but it also um, gives anionousia. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's, an, it's another pair of that same middle level. So we are still none the wiser in, in how we can right. know the good from being. Yeah. Yeah, right. He said, examine the similitude of it still further. So he's giving another step. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. I want to bring Jacob in. Um, I realize there's a lot to take in. It's your first time going through this and um, it, it's a whole lot to take in. So I'm wondering at this point, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what we part of what we covered was what I had understood as the three hypostases or mm -hmm. soul mm -hmm. and the good mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as mm -hmm. the intelligibles go, I guess a question mm -hmm. that I... I am uh, holding on to is if noose is the power of your soul to to know, then I guess the intelligibles are forms and they are like distinct uh, from your soul. So it makes me wonder about the. Mm. Uh, they're supposed to be on, on this analogy. They're on the same level. So, it, well, yeah. we are seeing a hierarchy, right? That the soul. Well, there, there's the physical world would be at the bottom of the hierarchy, but then he's giving us the soul, that functions in this physical world, but it can participate in noose. And when it participates in noose, it can take on that relationship of being able to turn and revert to its cause. And it can know the intelligibles and know their, the cause beyond that. So there are levels at the way he's presenting it here. Okay. So this isn't, even though in our diagram we have noose mm -hmm. and, or intellect and intelligibles on the same level. It's, I wasn't implying that they're the same metaphysical level. Right, right, right. It's it still very okay. Yeah. That's that's what I was mm -hmm. contemplating. So mm -hmm. that, that sorry, helps. sorry, sorry yeah. if my diagram was confusing. Then no, it's good. No, it's it's mm -hmm. good, and it's good for understanding the analogy straight from mm -hmm. the text. I, mm -hmm. Without your diagram, it was not as clear <laughs> exactly what he was talking about in the text. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm. I don't want to go on to the next section now because from here, he's going to go on to create the divided line. So there's two more sections to book six, and I'd like to look at these together because he's building the divided line from here. Okay. So I think this is probably a good place to stop, unless either of you have any other comments or thoughts about so far An another speculation mm -hmm. on this is how uh, this this relates I guess we're gonna get into it I know you just foreshadowed this with the divided line but how this uh I guess opinion would be less light mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not be more light mm. uh, that you're immersed right. in your soul he, right he talked about that here um back on page 103 um right when um when the eyes are no longer turned upon objects upon whose colors the day the light of day falls but that of the dim luminaries of night their edges blunted and they appear almost blind right so there's the idea that light is not just there gone it's not just on or off there can be degrees and that's, yeah, is foreshadowing the divided line.
I saw uh, Jed un unmuted before I said something. Mm -hmm. Do you have something? Oh, I'm still... Um, I'm always happy when I discover a question. The more that mm -hmm. I read Plato, the more I, I, I realize he writes this book the same mm -hmm. way Christopher Nolan does his movies. Like, there's the, there's the puzzle that you're given, and then you're supposed to discover another puzzle and figure out that. And also mm -hmm. Christopher Nolan and other similar films um, use something of the theme or the way the first puzzle is solved to inform the second hidden puzzle that most people won't realize. So, so hearing uh, Socrates say, oh, I'm not going to talk about the good, not for now, um, with this time around triggered that, oh, I wonder why. And now he's giving us an explicit analogy. And whenever he gives you something explicit, there is also something implicit. Like he, he'll give you, uh, the sun is like this and this is like this, but he won't give you that one wanting you to do some work. Mm -hmm. But he also can do that, but there's this other level. So I'm, I'm pleased that I discovered this puzzle this time around that there, and of course, um, uh, our friend uh, Glaucon is saying, hey, you, you know, you better promise to tell me this. Like, I'm asking you for what's the nature of the good. We can't spend all this time saying mm -hmm. that, you know, this is all about knowing the good um, and then not go into it. But I think maybe that's a nice way of answering him. Like, I can go into it. But he said, I don't know whether, because he kind of blamed Glaucon. He said, I don't know whether you'll be able to pick it up or not. And, a, and a, it's an interesting trick because you could say the same thing about a, a Nolan movie. I'll tell you, but I'm not sure if I'd be able to say it well, and I'm not sure if you'd be able to get it. But if it's there, it's a proof. You get it if you see it. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't discover what you need to discover, then you're right, you won't get it. But it's not, it's not that he's not saying it. He's saying, oh, I'm not sure you'll get it. In other words, if you reflect like Usia, mm -hmm. turn about and reflect, mm -hmm. direct your attention away from the visible things of the site, because that's just going to get your opinion. You're going to be blind and you're going to be dumb. Mm -hmm. But if you turn and reflect upon things that have uh, uh, logos and um, are from noose, like this mm -hmm. conversation, you will appear to be having some intelligence. You might realize that I am giving you what you need to solve the puzzle to actually get that thing that I said you might not get. So now that I've seen that, I'm really puzzled. Mm. Okay, how can we use this analogy of knowing being to get what we're really after, knowing the good? Mm. And obviously there's going to be some things that fall down because the, there can't be a cause of the good the same way the sun causes the light or the good causes the idea of the good. But... There might be some the sun. Yes, yes, and also causes the sun, but there might be an equivalent of two things relating. Although I have heard um, some philosophers suggest that the good and the one is might not be metaphysically the same level of the self if you can make distinctions mm -hmm. between them. Hmm. So maybe there is one more step to do with this this is in these pages so i'll leave that no, we have that's the thing that you have to solve the puzzle with the text itself so i'm looking for uh clues within the text to solve that most meaningful level i mean knowing okay. being is great but still it's transitory it's an experience and so on and so on we have to like in the symposium we have to use that to nurture our ultimate virtues mm -hmm. which would be reaching the good so i'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. for i'm looking for the correlates the higher okay. level as we read. All right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Something to look for as we go on. Okay. So we're going to stop it there for today. And then next week we will maybe do a little bit of review, make sure that we got this down because it is a really important section, but it is something that requires more than one look. It's not the kind of, this is not the kind of book, right? That you just read once straight through like a novel and you got it. It's a lot of work. So we're going to maybe just look over it a little bit more and then we'll go on to the divided line. Okay. So
So those of you watching this on YouTube, as always, thank you very much for watching. And if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to put those in the description box, or sorry, in the comment section. And as always, um, I'd appreciate you hitting the like button if you watched it this far. And I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you very much. Zalang. So